All of what we know of Valyria has been passed down through generations of histories. Maesters have written their stories and documented what they could, but there is still so much that we do not know. We know the basics. Valyria is where the Targaryens come from. Valyria is where the dragons come from. Valyria was the most magnificent city that ever was. One whose like has never been duplicated. Valyria was magical and Valyria was lost in the doom. But what about the in-between, the details, the forgotten things, or the things that aren't as popular to speculate on? We will venture into ancient Essos before the dragons dominated Westeros, when Valyria was at the peak of her reign, when Essos lived in the dragon's shadow. In the dawn of her days, Valyria was nothing to be feared, if the tales can be believed. Valyrians were but meek shepherds that guarded their flocks. For all we know, Valyrians could have been worshippers of the Great Shepherd. Much like the Lazarene people that the Dothraki slaughtered before called Drogo was wounded in a Game of Thrones. According to one legend, Valyrians were shepherds that turned to dragon lords when dragons allegedly sprang forth from the Fourteen Flames. The Fourteen Flames is a chain of volcanoes that encompass the Valyrian Peninsula. But there are many legends that conflict with each other when it comes to the origin of dragons. In Karth, there is a legend that the moon was an egg and got too close to the sun and dragons came forth from that solar union. There are legends that dragons originated in Ashai and it was the Ashai that taught the Valyrians how to tame dragons. Septon Barth has a theory that Valyrian blood mages made the dragons. Theorists that have been studying the ancient dragons of Old Valyria and their legends and lore have found evidence that the Valyrians could be descendants of the Great Empire of the Dawn. Theorists have also suggested gene-mutating interspecies mating, which could suggest that Septim Barth has the right of it. What is more probable is that pieces of these legends could all be true. A piece from each legend could solve the puzzle of the true origin of dragons. But the origin of dragons isn't important here. What is important is that no one anywhere in the known world, no one anywhere in any legend in any history book mastered the art of taming dragons like the Valyrians did. The Valyrians raised dragons, tamed them, trained them and used them to conquer a continent. This didn't happen overnight. Some say the true art of riding a dragon and bending a dragon to your will requires a special blood, blood of the dragon, blood of old Illyria. There is evidence that supports this, but then there is also things that occur during the Dance of Dragons that muddy the water a little bit. Rhaenyra Targaryen invited dragon seeds, bastards of dragonstone believed to be of Targaryen or Valyrian descent, to come and tame wild dragons of dragonstone or the dragons that did not have riders. Nettles, who was believed to be a Targaryen bastard, some suggest even the bastard daughter of Daemon Targaryen. She bonded with her dragon, Sheepstealer, by bringing sheep to him every morning, and people that we know were of Valyrian descent were almost killed trying to tame dragons. Daenerys used no instrument to mount Drogon, but Victarion has a curious horn that he got from Euron Greyjoy. It's covered in Valyrian glyphs. It's a dragon horn, and the noise that it makes sounds like the screaming of a thousand souls, and it seems to listeners as if their very bones are on fire and searing their flesh from within. That horn you heard, I found amongst the smoking ruins that were Valyria, where no man has dared to walk but me. You heard its call and felt its power. It is a dragon horn, bound with bands of red and gold and Valyrian steel graven with enchantments. The dragon lords of old sounded such horns before the doom devoured them. With this horn, Iron Men, I can bind dragons to my will. So maybe it wasn't blood. Maybe it was just magical horns. 
Makoro, the Black Flame, tells Victarion Greyjoy, the horn reads, No mortal man will sound me and live. Blood for fire, fire for blood. Any dragon that hears the horn will obey the horn's master. But Dragonbinder is only one of the many enchanted mysterious things to come out of Valyria. Did the Valyrians use enchanted horns, whips, magical spells? Was it their blood? Does it matter? However they did it, they conquered dragons. And with dragons, they conquered everything else. Before Valyria gained control over much of Essos, they lived in the Harpy's shadow. 5,000 years ago, the empire of Old Geese dominated much of Essos. As Krasnus would say, Old Geese ruled an empire when the Valyrians were still fucking sheep. Records indicate that the Giscari Empire was in full bloom during the Long Night in Westeros about 8,000 years ago. So the Giscari Empire was the lands of Slaver's Bay, Astapor, Young Kai, and Marine, but it was expanding. How the conflict with the Giscari Empire came to be is of dispute. Some say that the Giscari wanted their own dragons and the Valyrians were only defending themselves. The other legends say that Valyrians wanted power and had the means to gain it through dragons and they used their dragons as weapons of war and started with the Giscari because the Giscari was not about to give up one inch of land to the sheep fuckers of Valyria. When I look at the records and all of the information that we have, it indicates to me that the Valyrians did not know the power that they had in dragons. Because if they did, they wouldn't have went to war with the Giscari people five times. They would have went to war with them one time and they would have just ended them all. But there wasn't. There were five. Five wars between the Valyrians and the Giscari seem to indicate that the Valyrians were not using their dragons as they could have. Maybe they didn't know the dragon's full potential. Maybe they hadn't mastered the arts. Maybe they didn't want to kill thousands of people. Throughout these wars for dominance, Old Geese won some battles. Sir Barrison notices an ancient tapestry in the Pyramid of Marine that depicted one of their victories. On the walls were priceless tapestries, ancient and much faded, depicting the glory of the old empire of geese. The largest of them showed the last survivors of a defeated Valyrian army passing beneath the yoke and being chained. So, like I said, the Giscari won some battles and enslaved some Valyrians, but they never won the wars. And with each victory, Valyria gained more ground, but the Harpy would not give up so easily. The fifth time the Harpy and the Dragon went to war, Valyria made sure there would not be a sixth war. Maester Yandel describes it best. The ancient brick walls of Old Geese, first erected by Grasdan the Great in ancient days, were raised. The colossal pyramids and temples and homes were given over to dragon flame. The fields were sown with salt, lime, and skulls. Many of the Giscari were slain, and still others were enslaved and died laboring for their conquerors. Thus, the Giscari became but another part of the new Valyrian Empire. And in time, they forgot the tongue that Grasdan spoke, learning instead High Valyrian. So do empires end and others rise. It was from the Giscari that the Valyrians learned slavery. The more they conquered, the more they enslaved. With the Giscari completely defeated, nothing stood in the way of the Valyrian expansion. And they expanded west. Valyria is often referred to as an empire, but it really wasn't. An empire is usually ruled by an emperor and there is a different political structure than what existed in Valyria. Valyria was actually a capital city of the freehold of Valyria. The political structure of the freehold or those that held power were about 40 noble families. They were lords, landowners, rich families, and the most powerful of all were dragon lords. 
One of the biggest misconceptions is that every Valyrian was a dragon lord or every Valyrian had a dragon. That doesn't seem to be the case. House Targaryen was one of the noble families that held power in Valyria. They were dragon lords, but they were not the most powerful by a long shot. The dragon lords were also known to feud with each other. Rival houses vied for power and glory in court and council, rising and falling in an endless, subtle, off-savage struggle for dominance, as would be expected in any political structure. House Valerian also a noble house of Valyria. They were a lesser house. They weren't referred to as dragon lords. They didn't have dragons, but they left Valyria before the doom and before the Targaryens did, settling on an island in the Blackwater Bay known as Driftmark. Whenever House of the Dragon comes out, House Valerian will be a prominent house. But the Valyrians, they did what they did. They conquered. They conquered most of Essos and established what are called the Free Cities. Belantis, Tyros, Norvos, Pentos, Lys, Mir, Larath, and Cohor. All of these cities were born from Valyrian colonization. They are known as the Daughters of Valyria. Bravos, which is also a free city, is often referred to as the Bastard Daughter of Valyria because Bravos was founded by escaped Valyrian slaves and it wasn't actually founded by Valyria. So these cities were used for different things and they were taken for different reasons. Valantis was the first daughter of Valyria and seemed to just be a military outpost with walls of black stone made to protect the Valyrian borders. Not any black stone though. The walls weren't made of just any black stone. They are made of black stone that is forged in dragon fire. Given its location on the ruin and its proximity to Valyria, Valantis became rich and grew even bigger still. Tyros was another military outpost that Valyria constructed to control the trade through the step zones. Pentos was another city found as a trade post. Lys was also formed as a trade post, but due to the climate and or pleasure houses, it became a resort destination for dragon lords. And the blood of the dragon still runs deep in Lys. There's silver and gold-headed, lilac-eyed people all about. The westernmost trading post of Valyria was Dragonstone, a citadel on an island off of Blackwater Bay. Valyria grew rich and powerful, and the more it grew, the more people fled west to Westeros to escape the Valyrian tide. While we don't know for sure, the first men could have been fleeing dragons. The Andals fled Andalos landing their ships in the Vale of Arryn and waging war on the Children of the Forest. The histories claim they are the only race to withstand the Valyrians, but the history lies because they wrote it. Maesters point to their invasion of Westeros being a tuck tail and running from the Valyrians kind of thing. The Ronar were also pushed from their civilizations and into Westeros. They did fight the Valyrians and they lost badly. There were wars fought and thousands and thousands of Roynish died before Nymeria led her people to safety with 10,000 ships. Meanwhile in Valyria, coffers are swelling. Slaves are toiling in the mines. Beneath the volcanic 14 flames are mines. The kindly man tells Arya how the faceless men came to be, deep in the shafts of the mines of Valyria. We first took root in Valyria, amongst the wretched slaves who toiled in the deep mines beneath the fourteen flames that lit the freehold nights of old. Most mines are dank and chilly places, cut from cold dead stone. But the fourteen flames were living mountains with veins of molten rock and hearts of fire. So the mines of Old Valyria were always hot, and they grew hotter as the shafts were driven deeper, ever deeper. The slaves toiled in an oven. The rocks around them were too hot to touch. The air stank of brimstone and would sear the lungs as they breathed it. The soles of their feet would burn and blister, even through the thickest sandals. Sometimes, when they broke through a wall in search of gold, they would find steam instead, or boiling water, or molten rock. 
Certain shafts were cut so low that the slaves could not stand upright, but had to crawl or bend. And there were worms in that red darkness too. Fireworms. Some say they are akin to dragons, for worms breathe fire too. Instead of soaring through the sky, they bore through the stone and soil. If the old tales can be believed, there were worms amongst the fourteen flames even before the dragons came. The young ones are no larger than that skinny arm of yours, but they can grow to monstrous size and have no love for men. Burnt and blackened corpses were oft found in the shafts where the rocks were cracked or full of holes, yet still the mind drove deeper. Slaves perished by the score, but their masters did not care. Red gold and yellow gold and silver were reckoned to be more precious than the lives of slaves, for slaves were cheap in the freehold. During war, the Valyrians took them by the thousands. In time of peace, they bred them, though only the worst were sent down to die in the red darkness. The Valyrians have slaves mining an active volcano. Now, there is much to be said about fireworms, and we will speak on them, but the 14 flames are what would eventually cause the doom, one way or another. As we know, Valyria is one of the most, if not the most, magical places in the world of ice and fire. Valyria bred, birthed, raised, and tamed dragons. They spell-forged Valyrian steel. They made magical glass candles that are quite literally the Skype of their era. They had magical horns that controlled dragons. Everything in the name of fire and blood, sorcery, and fire magic, which likely came at a great cost. Blood sacrifice. Everything that Valyria lost in the doom cannot be duplicated today. Magic was strong in Old Valyria. Septon Barth claimed that Valyria had used spells to tame the 14 flames for thousands of years, and that their ceaseless hunger for slaves and wealth was as much to sustain these spells as to expand their power. Valyria was an advanced civilization. The dragon roads they paved are still standing today in Essos. Their gargoyles on Dragonstone still keep their shape hundreds of years after the doom. The Black Wall of Volantis still looms large. Valyrians had plenty gods. It seemed maybe too many gods. While we don't know much about their religion, we do know that Balerion, Maraxes, and Vagar, the dragons of Aegon, Rhaenys, and Visenya, were named for Valyrian gods. As Valyria continued to rise, slaves were mining, Valyria was getting richer, the faceless men were forming, wars were ongoing, people were dying, their lands being conquered. But the sun was setting on Valyria, and for most, it would never rise again. Twelve years before the doom, the Targaryens left for the westernmost outpost of the freehold, Dragonstone. Rival dragonlords saw this as an act of cowardice, as a Targaryen defeat. But Daenys the Dreamer, ancestor to Aegon the Conqueror, allegedly dreamed that Valyria would be consumed by fire. There are rumors that the Targaryens may have even caused the doom, and we will get into that in a few minutes. The ancient mighty freehold, home to the dragon and sorcerers of unrivaled skill, was shattered and destroyed within hours. It was written that every hill for 500 miles split asunder to fill the air with ash and smoke and fire so hot and hungry that even dragons in the sky were engulfed and consumed. Great rents opened in the earth, swallowing places, temples, and entire towns. Lakes boiled and turned to acid. Mountains burst. Fiery fountains spewed molten rock a thousand feet into the air, and red clouds rained down dragon glass and the black blood of demons. To the north, the ground splintered and collapsed and fell in on itself, and an angry sea came boiling in. The proudest city in all the world was gone in an instant. The fabled empire vanished in a day. The lands of long summer, once the most fertile in all the world, 
were scorched and drowned and blighted, and the toll in blood would not be fully realized for a century to come. No one knows what caused the doom. There are theories that the faceless men caused the doom, or the doom was just a natural cataclysm. The 14 flames were always a ticking time bomb. There is another more sinister tale, and it has to do with House Targaryen and the Valyrian steel sword Bright Roar. Bright Roar was the Valyrian steel sword that House Lannister bought. The sword Bright Roar came into the possession of the Lannister kings in the century before the doom, and it is said that the weight of gold they paid for it would have been enough to raise an army. So a Lannister king buys a Valyrian steel sword, pays a lot of gold for it, and then the Valyrians had this prophecy that was written in ancient text. Septon Barth speculated on the matter referring to a Valyrian text that has since been lost, suggesting that the freehold sorcerers foretold that the gold of Casterly Rock would destroy them. So was it the gold for Bright Roar? Could that gold of Casterly Rock been used by House Targaryen to pay off someone to cause this scale of an event? It is suspicious that this one family and their dragon survived because their little daughter has a prophetic dream. If you look at it, who benefited the most from the doom of Valyria? House Targaryen. They became the last living dragon lords and the most powerful people in the world. They ended up building a dynasty that lasted 300 years. No one knows, really. Some argue that it was the curse of Garen the Great at last coming to fruition. Others speak of the priests of R'hllor calling down the fire of their god in queer rituals, some wetting the fanciful notion of Valyrian magic to the reality of the ambitious great houses of Valyria, have argued that it was the constant whirl of conflict and deception amongst the great houses that might have led to the assassination of too many of the reputed mages who renewed and maintained the rituals that banked the fires of the Fourteen Flames. However it happened, it happened, and Valyria today is a ruin shrouded in mystery. Euron Greyjoy has said to have been to Valyria. He even has a suit of Valyrian steel armor, and the Dragonhorn Dragonbinder, Arya Targaryen, who claimed Balerion as her mount, was taken to Valyria by Balerion, and when she returned, she had worms with human faces burning her from inside out. It was horrid, and she died in agony. Even Balerion was wounded when he returned. Jerrion Lannister set sail with Bright Roar, and him nor his sword ever returned. When Tyrion is on the ship with Makoro, he sees Valeria from a distance. A dull red glow lit the sky to the northeast, the color of a blood bruise. Tyrion had never seen a bigger moon, monstrous, swollen. It looked as if it had swallowed the sun and woken with a fever. Its twin, floating on the sea beyond the ship, shimmered red with every wave. What hour is this? he asked Makoro. That cannot be sunrise unless the east has moved. Why is the sky red? The sky is always red above Valyria, Hugor Hill. To this day, Valyria still glows red in the night, and Tyrion, mistaking the sun rising in the west, makes me wonder about Miri Mazdor's prophecy and if Valyria has anything to do with that. Valyria of old is gone. A new sea is in its place, the Smoking Sea, cutting right through the city that was. Fourteen flames erupting, causing the night sky to glow red. Mokoro calls them the flames of God's wrath. What once was the greatest city in the known world is now a ruin, and anyone that should step foot on the ancient ruins, doom will be his fate. Until what is left sinks beneath the waves, Valyria will remain an ancient wonder, drawing the careless souls of treasure hunters and adventure seekers for years to come. Valyria is the last ember, but an ember in the ashes can still ignite a great blaze. As long as House Targaryen prospers, Valyria lives on, and Aegon the Conqueror and his sisters are going to serve Westeros fire and blood. 
I really hope you guys like this Valeria video. I will be doing lots of videos like this, very informative videos on Fire and Blood. I cover Valeria and next we're going to be doing Aegon's Conquest. We're moving on to the Fire and Blood reread. So I am super duper excited. As always, thanks for watching. Thanks to everyone that supports me on Patreon. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please click that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and join the Sweet Summer family. Okay, my sweet summer children, have a good day.